Hi, and welcome to the Restorative Wellness Clinician's Corner, a video series exclusively for functional health professionals, where we interview the top experts in the latest research, products, tools, and best practices for getting your clients exceptional results. Welcome everybody to today's episode of the RWS Clinician's Corner. I am so excited about today's guest. We get asked probably the number one question and the topic that we get asked about that we haven't till until today had good answers for because this is outside of our field of expertise is about cancer, about how do we support clients who are struggling with this and we every single one of us, I can't imagine there's anybody who is here who doesn't have some kind of personal and or professional experience with this. So it is something that arises. And um, our guest today is Dr. Nasha Winters. I'm going to read her formal bio. Welcome, Dr. Nasha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So excited to be here with all of you. We are thrilled. So I'm going to read her formal bio, and then we actually have a guest interviewer today as well, which is even more fun. So Dr. Nisha Winters is a global healthcare authority and best-selling author in integrative cancer care and research, consulting with physicians around the world. She has educated hundreds of professionals in the clinical use of mistletoe and has created robust educational programs for both healthcare institutions and the public on incorporating vetted integrative therapies in cancer care to enhance outcomes. Dr. Winters is currently focused on opening a comprehensive metabolic oncology hospital and research institute in the U.S., where the best that standard of care has to offer and the most advanced integrative therapies will be offered. This facility will be in a residential setting on a gorgeous campus against a backdrop of regenerative farming, EMF mitigation, and retreat as well as state-of-the-art medical technology and data collection and evaluation to improve patient outcomes. I mean, seriously, <laughs> I don't want to get cancer, but if I did, I want to go there, right? <laughs> like it almost it sounds like fun. Um, so we have today, so Katrina Fo, who many of you know and love is one of our RWS instructor team. Um, she is a fantastic practitioner and she had the privilege of studying very intimately with Dr. Nasha. So she is actually going to lead this interview for us um, because she is so intimately familiar with, of course, the RWS methodology, as well as Dr. Nasha's teachings and methodology and has personally benefited. So Katrina, I'm going to pass this over to you. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah. So I actually got introduced to Dr. Nasha when I had my own cancer journey, which I think a lot of you know, um, is what got me into this work. And I found her book, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, her first book. And it just opened up a whole new window of possibilities of a different paradigm, a way to look at healthcare. And, and that's, that's the basic paradigm that I followed with my own cancer journey. And when I went back to become a practitioner, it was all within my, like, I want to work with her, <laughs> cyber stalking her. And so it's, it's my pleasure and joy to have gotten to, you know, be a graduate of her practitioner program and gotten to meet her and um, enjoy her in person and stuff as well. So I am super excited about this interview. Um, so hello, Nasha, how are you doing today? So good. What an honor to be a part of your tribe. Now you've like been part of mine for some time. It's really a, quite a gift to be on the other side. So thank you. Yeah, these are all dear practitioners. So would you mind starting and giving everyone a little overview of how you got into this work and what inspired you to take this journey on, on helping everyone else as well? Sure. Well, I think that Margaret spoke to it so well that unfortunately, most of us have a very intimate experience with the, the, the cancer you know, club if you will. And so for me, this wasn't a vocation. It didn't wake up one day and say, gosh, I think I'm going to really focus and specialize in cancer. Like many of you, I had my own dance with this process at a, at a very ripe age of 19, actually. So 32 years ago, this coming October of 2023, I was given a terminal diagnosis. Um, standard of care had missed my process many times over, unfortunately. And by the time I landed in the hospital, really down the rabbit hole, 
people, they did not have anything to offer me. And so I had no expectation of surviving this. I just wanted to understand why a 19 year old would have a diagnosis of stage four ovarian cancer that everyone seemingly missed for a very, very long time. And so that has been a 30 plus year journey for me to understand my why, but then also to apply that to at this point, over 10,000 patients directly and likely hundreds of thousands, thousands of patients indirectly through my work of trying to understand why we have this cancer process going on, which I know is what we're going to speak a lot to today. Um, some of the ideas around what, what this may be. But one thing I want to mention is that just a few short years ago, a decade or so ago, when I would present at a medical conference, I would literally ask the question, how many of you in this room have had a personal experience with cancer, whether your own diagnosis or someone near and dear to you? And at that time, maybe 20, 30% of the room would raise their hand. I have to reframe that question today. Now I have to ask the question, how many of you have not had a personal experience with cancer or someone near and dear to you? And now maybe a handful of hands go up. That's what's happened in a very short period of time. And unfortunately, despite the fact that the RDF, RWS community does not focus in oncology, you will see more and more of this in your careers. And we want you to feel empowered and supported to be able to meet those folks and bring the support that's much, much needed in, in this growing global community. Oh, it's fantastic. Exactly. It's such a, an epidemic. So how does the work that you do differ from alternative healthcare, cancer treatments in general? Like what unique approaches or perspectives are you bringing to the table? Sure. Well, one thing is I will tell you from the early days of my diagnosis, I was pretty, let's see, disgruntled might be a good way to describe of standard of care of conventional medicine in the very beginning, because I had been missed. I, I was in, a, in that time in my diagnosis, I was very much a victim. I was very angry at the medical establishment. I was sort of angry at the world around me of how this could have happened. But my tune has changed over these last decades. And what I realized is when I sort of objectified standard of care as the problem, that wasn't helpful. That wasn't helpful for me or for anybody else on this journey. Just like over time, when I started to meet more and more people that were really frustrated with standard of care, I was the weird voice out there asking for them to consider that there are options to do the best of both worlds, to upgrade standard of care as we know it, and to really use data to understand what alternative therapies or integrative therapies are best for each of us at whatever given time. And so that sounds maybe a little cryptic right now, but ultimately what I've learned over my 30 plus years is there's the best of both worlds. There is a thoughtful met methodology in choosing the right treatment at the right dose, at the right duration, at the right combination, at the right time. And that may or may not include things from standard of care, surgery, radiation, targeted therapies, immune therapies, et cetera, but also may include what are considered alternative therapies. I like to talk to talk about them more as integrative because alternative for whatever reason has sort of a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. And it's even funny that over decades, we've changed the definition. It used to be the, um, the um, alternative medicine the, uh, kind of group out of NIH was this very small group that started back in the early 1990s. Later, it became known as CAM, Complementary and Alternative Medicine. And about a decade after that, we changed that, um, that terminology yet again to CIM, C-I-M, Complementary and Integrative Medicine. So even in the last three decades, even standard of care has renamed who we are. And when I think about alternative versus standard of care, they tend to still be at both sides of an equation. And there tends to be this huge chasm in between. And what I've aimed to do and what I hope you all walk away with from this conversation today is there's this beautiful bridge that can be built between the two. And that there is a particular methodology and way of thinking about when is the right approach for you or a loved one or a client 
at any given time. You don't have to guess of when that might be. And you certainly don't have to depend on just alternative or just standard of care. I believe they should both be offered simultaneously and in the right circumstances and the right combinations. Oh, I love that. And I just have to tell you, that's like when I hear, when I hear your voice, I hear test, don't guess, test. Don't guess. <laughs> exactly. um, can you give everyone um, a brief overview of the Terrain 10 and how you use that with the testing to look at, you know, what is, what is the right thing without guessing for them? Sure. Sure. Well, first of all, again, and I'm not sure if I'm speaking to anybody in this room, but when patients have said to me, I was healthy until I got cancer. If I had a dollar for every time I heard that, I could have retired a very long time ago. Um, but that is just an impossibility. And so what I've learned over three plus decades is that there are kind of some common denominators of what might contribute to a cancering environment or a cancering terrain. You'll hear me use that word a lot. Katrina has already alluded to these terrain drivers. And so you look at some of my colleagues like Paul Anderson, he talks about maybe the seven of these things or Dr. Um, Jimenez talks about these. There's a lot of different kind of pillars or different drivers, uh, contributors to health or disease. And for me, I've sort of categorized them into 10. So the 10 are as followed and following, and I'm going to kind of blaze through this. So I'm glad you're recording because I sound like an auctioneer sometimes. So number one are epigenetics. This is the blueprint we were all born with. Okay. This is not your destiny. This is above the genes that you have the ability to make dietary and lifestyle choices that change the expression or suppression of a whole pile of genes that you came into this world with. And that could have been influenced by 12 generations upstream from you. That's what's so amazing about the research, but it also means that you have the opportunity to change 12 generations downstream from you with choices you make today. So a much more hopeful and empowering message than what we're often taught to believe that our genes, you know, pull the trigger. Um, we're not sitting ducks. We're not victims. We have a lot more opportunity to change expression than we're led to believe. Number two, our metabolic um, machinery. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a year in a moment, but ultimately what fuel are your cells using to drive this container, this, this meat suit down the road. Okay. And so we have a lot of opportunities to change the expression with that as well. Number three, toxins. My teacher, the late and great Dr. Walter Crenion in the environmental medicine world, he talks about the fact that we are no longer about if you have toxicity, it's how bad is it and how does it intermingle with the fuel you put into your body, as well as the epigenetic blueprint that you were born with. Because we all have a little bit of a different sort of, oh, kind of, kind of threshold, I suppose. Like my husband loves the smell of diesel, but I smell it and I immediately want to throw up and get a headache and or feel terrible. We all have kind of different thresholds and that toxicant exposure expresses itself differently. Number four, our, our microbiome. I mean, my gosh, as a naturopathic doctor who's been preaching about the microbiome my entire career, as well as has anybody from the Chinese medicine or the Ayurvedic medicine or the naturopathic medicine world, it's only been in the last few years that standard of care has caught up to the importance of our microbiome. And so basically what little critters are inhabiting in our body, living inside our bodies that are helping us respond to our environment in a very different way. And so good or bad. And so we have the ability to adjust that. Number five, our immune um, drop in the bucket. So if you've been living under a rock for the last three years, um, you might have missed that we've been in this kind of global pandemic, <laughs> um, which to me, the real pandemic that Katrina alluded to is more about the chronic illnesses that are affecting us today. And we'll go into that more in a moment. Um, but this virus should show us our weakness, our vulnerability with regards to our immune function or dysfunction or lack of function altogether. So that's a big contributor. And then we have inflammation. We're known as the inflammation nation now in this modern times. We used to die from infections actually still did in the last couple of years, shouldn't have though, but did. Um, but we now die more from inflammatory processes. And so we'll talk about that. 
And then this blood, this uh, angiogenesis, this, this oxygenation and circulation drop in the bucket. How well are you utilizing your oxygen stores? How well are you perfusing or bringing oxygen into your tissues and into your cells? Then number seven is your hormonal health and the balance, the modulation of those. How does your body interpret your own endogenous hormones as well as how does your body interpret exogenous hormones. And then the final two are the biggies. So the stress and circadian rhythm. So how is your body dealing with the day-to-day -day of, you know, light and dark cycles, exposures to screens, since the blue blockers, um, standing on grounding mats, like I'm doing right now, things like that. Like how is your body responding to sort of the stressors on your circadian rhythm today, as well as the emotional, the physical, and the energetic and even environmental stressors that we're all exposed to. And then last but not least, the biggest drop in the bucket, often the least dealt with, because it's always easier to deal with the tangible, is the intangible of the mental, emotional, spiritual sphere of things. And even one of my teachers, friends, colleagues, uh, Dr. Kelly Turner, who wrote the book Radical Remission, she talks about the 10 major factors of radical remission or spontaneous remission individuals. And only two of those are tangible, maybe three, but one of them diet, you do have control over that. That's something you can do supplements. Okay. So that's another thing you can do. She later brought in the category of exercise. So thank God we got Katrina here. Who's really big on this topic. Um, a published author about this topic, but all of the other seven drivers, seven factors, all are on that mental, emotional, spiritual, and stress response environment. And that is the one thing that's most difficult for most of us to achieve and remain healthy within that context. So I told you it would be fast and furious, but those are the big 10 drops in the bucket, the terrain bucket that impact our health or disease state at any given time. Oh, I love that. That was super concise and clear. I love it. So just to like tease that out. So if somebody has cancer, they have like one thing off, right? <laughs> right. Everyone, we like to think that, right? We like to think there's a single target and a single agent to treat that target. I wish it were that simple. Even the American Cancer Society says that cancer is a collection of hundreds of diseases. Mm. Yeah. Very well said. So what kinds of testing do you use with your clients? Um, I'm just really excited to have um, the RWS tribe see that there's a lot of overlap and, and how connected that is and, and how you use that for assessment. Well, I think because we are a culture and a society that is very data-driven today, we like our feedback, whether it's biofeedback, whether it's wearable technologies, whether it's blood tests, functional analysis, um, a good physical examination, some really cool, um, you know, like... Uh, you know, just different assessments. There's so many different ways, pulse diagnosis, tongue diagnosis, you name it. There's ways to gather data on yourself. Some people like to use a magic crystal ball, right? Whatever, whatever that may be to gather the information. We are now a culture that can actually be data driven. And so with that being said, I, as I mentioned before, never have met a patient that was quote unquote healthy and developed cancer. That's an impossibility. But what I have met are a lot of people who were clueless at what maybe drops in that bucket, those 10 drops we were just talking about, maybe what 10 drops were contributing to the illness that their bodies were dealing with. And so with that, we have a ton of different ways to test. Now we can definitely test through basic labs. So things like your complete blood count, your metabolic panels, your in, um, inflammatory markers, your lipid panels, your autoimmune panels. You can look at the basic blood tests. You can also look at what I know is near and dear to this group, more of the functional medicine testing. So, you know, things like your um, lymphocyte map test from Cyrex or your GI map or GI effects from one of the different, uh, you know, laboratory companies out there, or even looking into things like 
you know, like heavy metal testing or mold testing or um, co-infection testing to look at what else might be driving the train, but also down to like a good nutritional physical exam. So like inquiring about people's status, their fingernails or the hair um, patterns on their body or their uh, sleep patterns, their bowel patterns, all of those things of really asking good medical histories, personal and medical family histories, doing a physical examination and nutritional physical examination. You can also use the wearables, you know, as I mentioned, like um, the, the Fitbits or the aura rings to understand your circadian rhythm a bit better. You can even test your co continuous glucose monitoring. There's now continuous ketone monitoring, but also blood, urine, breath, ketone testing. There's so many ways today that we can actually assess our environment, our internal environment, and our external environment, because a lot of people take for granted that the fact that the people you spend your time, most amount of your time with can also alter your physiology, your biochemistry. So that's a big one. So I've many people who've heard me speak before have heard me kind of inquire about patients who might actually need a jawbectomy or a husbandectomy or a friendectomy when, when they're in the wrong environments that no longer suit them or support them. And so these are the types of things when we dig deep into our patients, we have a 50 plus page intake questionnaire. We have a terrain 10 questionnaire, which goes through the main questions of those 10 drops in the bucket and helps us determine which is the priority for that patient. And then we use that exterior data. So blood tests, functional tests, physical examinations, wearables, et cetera, that helps me really illuminate a pattern and a picture of exactly who that person is. So I know where they are in this moment. And it's only then Am I able, or somebody like Katrina, who's come through my training, able to know, okay, what's the next step? What's the priority? What therapy is going to be the best suited at this time? Or if we don't have all the information yet, what further testing needs to be done so we can get that information to make a very thoughtful roadmap forward? Oh, well put. Okay, so let's dive into the food. We are primarily <laughs> a lot of nutritionists. So I know everyone wants to know, like, can you talk about the big elephant in there? I'm like, what does diet, how does it play into cancer? And what are your thoughts on that? I love it. Boy, howdy. Talk about dogma versus data, right? This one is a big deal. This one, because we have to remember that food, I mean, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. So apologies for that, but food is very emotional, right? We, everything we do is celebrating around food. It's a reward system. It is impacting even our neurochemistry. Um, so all of these different things literally drive our very behaviors and our relationships and our patterns and our lifestyle choices. So with that being said is, is there one single diet for the planet? And, and there's, there's no easy answer and there's no one diet but there is the way to assess what diet in what moment fits that person's epigenetics, fits their labs, fits the, the goal of whatever um, treatment outcome or you know, outcome for the patient we're striving to meet. But I think there's a few simple, simple kind of common denominators. So whether you're in the carnivore camp or the vegan camp or the paleo camp or the keto camp or the omnivore camp or the breatharian camp, you know, there, maybe, maybe not the breathitarian camp, but ultimately across the board, we need to be thinking today, living on the planet of the major changes that have happened in the last 150, 200 years or so is that we are incredibly metabolically broken. And by that, I think, I think I'm pretty sure in this room, everyone would agree with that. I even see a few emphatic head nods. Um, and so specifically when I say that and why this is important to preface the conversation around diet is in 2018, there was that North Carolina, that Chapel Hill, North Carolina study that came out showing that less than 12% of Americans and can we just like, yes, we're being American centric here, but really this is true for any really westernized developed country. It's not America centric. Like the rest of the world is quickly on our heels, if not even a little bit ahead of us in our metabolic brokenness. But ultimately let's just say for 
sake of argument that 12% of the planet of adults on this planet are metabolically healthy. So that already is telling us that 88% of us aren't. So common denominator there. But then we fast forward post COVID in July of 2022, um, the cardiology community came up with an, an updated number to this. And I'm sure you guys have talked about this ad nauseum, but we now know that less than 6.7% of adults on the planet are metabolically healthy. Yeah. What this should land on all of you is to realize you have, unfortunately, major job security. Okay. We don't want that, but it's the reality. And we need you because we have a large population now at this point, close to 93% of adults on this planet are in trouble metabolically. By that, I mean that they have problems with their blood pressure, problems with their blood sugar, problems with their lipid profile, problems with their hip to waist ratio, problems with their stamina, problems with their musculature and their, um, like their, the, the strength of their, of their muscles and the function of their muscles. So with that being said, all of those things, if you have to take a medication for any one of those things, you fit into the classification that you're metabolically broken. So if you're like, well, my blood pressure is perfect, but you take two different pharmaceuticals to make that happen. That is not perfect right? If your lipids are off kilter and you take a pharmaceutical for that, that is not perfect. I also want to qualify that even what these two major studies described as being metabolically healthy, we still in our community, in the Metabolic Training Institute of Health community, as well as likely in the RWS community, we have a bit tighter <laughs> patterns of, of, of what we think is healthy versus not healthy. And so to, to qualify this a little bit, then I promise I'll get to diet, but labs today are based on the average of the population mm -hmm. in the region in which they're being run. So how many of you here have seen like labs from patients getting their labs drawn, say in the state of Colorado, versus labs drawn in say the state of Kentucky or Alabama. Mm -hmm. When you put those labs next to each other, right? Especially because you look then at the demographics and you see who has the better health outcomes. Colorado is up at the top three, typically every few years when that gets redone. And unfortunately, Alabama or Kentucky are usually at the bottom three every few years. So when you look at when they say, hey, in Alabama, your blood sugar is fine if you're at 120 a fasting culture of 120, right? In Colorado, they say it's a problem if it's over 90. Do you see the, the difference? That's a problem. So we want to base our labs and our evaluations on optimal averages, not based on the averages of the population, especially now that you all realize that 93% or better of us are metabolically broken. So you don't want to fit that average right? So for instance, a blood sugar, when they say, oh, your blood sugar should be under a hundred for you to fit in metabolically healthy. My suspicion is we're actually not even 6.8% of us being metabolically healthy because most of the, of the labs I look at, it's very, very rare for me to find a blood sugar under 85. And yet that's my range of a healthy fasting glucose level. The other thing is a fasting glucose level really means nothing, right? It's so transient. It's so dynamic. It could have been a stress response or a, or a dawn effect. It could have been what you ate or didn't eat in the days leading up to this. So what's more telling is an insulin, a C-peptide or hemoglobin A1C. Those are going to give you less fungible results. And that is where in our crazy medical system, we don't even run those tests unless someone's glucose gets too elevated, quote unquote, under that 120 zone. So you can imagine the numbers of people we're missing that are falling through the cracks that are metabolically broken. So the same thing kind of comes down to the blood pressure. We are super, super obsessed about a blood pressure being 120 over 80. Anything above that, we consider that being a problem. 
But here's what's really weird is we also overshoot our treatment of blood pressure with pharmaceuticals. And we make these people with like blood pressures of 90 over 60, like almost ready to pass out who have no, no oxygen in their system, setting them up for a cancering process because a hypoxic low oxygen environment is one of the biggest triggers to set off growth factors for the cancer world. So you don't want to be over-treated there, similar in the lipid world. So we've been terrifying. So when I was in medical school back in the night in the nineties, before statins hit the market in 1996, does anybody here, was anybody else practicing or looking at labs prior to 1996? Probably a lot of you weren't even born then. So, you, you know, you're welcome. This just made you feel better about yourself. But in 1995, 1996, the cutoff for overall cholesterol was 399. The cutoff for overall triglycerides was 399. The cutoff for overall LDL was 299. We didn't know anything about HDL. We didn't know anything about very low lip, you know, VLDLs or any of those things. We didn't even have that nomenclature at that time. We only started to lower the parameters of, of our lipids based on a pharmaceutical sale, not on the reality of a patient's outcome. So let me rephrase that. The advent of statins coming out on the market in 1996 has had virtually no effect on overall survival rate for, from cardiovascular events to the human population. And yet every few years, we try to push that number lower and lower, 399 to 350, 350 to 300, 300 to 275 to 250, to 200. I feel like an auctioneer. Do I get a 200? Do I get a 175? We're now pushing for patients to get their blood pressure, their um, overall cholesterol levels under 175. But in the oncology world, one of the most ominous signs I will ever see with a patient when I'm reviewing their labs is a low cholesterol. Anything under 175, I start to get a little chill up my spine. If it's under 165, I'm looking for cancer. Let that sink in a little bit. So we are pushing people in the wrong directions and we're not talking about what really matters. We also spent the last 50 years in this crazy experiment saying that fat is bad and sugar is good because we said fat's so bad, let's take it out of everything, but then it tastes so terrible, we have to bring something else on board. <laughs> and so we do that by adding in sugar. And we've turned ourselves into sugar burners and our bodies have forgotten to be this natural hybrid system that we were designed to be. I mean, do you realize we're all born in ketosis? Unless your mother is uh, pre-diabetic, like, um, you know, if you're gestational diabetes, but ultimately non-gestational diabetes moms. Their kiddos are born in ketosis and they go into deeper ketosis before the, the milk fully engages, before the milk fully comes in. And so our bodies have this natural tendency. We're not meant to graze 24 seven every day of the year, every season of the year. You're not meant to eat a papaya in Durango, Colorado in the winter. You know, probably like you're probably not supposed to eat a pumpkin in, you know, Mexico in the summer. Like these are the crazy places that we've changed our world so drastically that we're no longer matching our genes, our season, our locale. We've gotten so far from that. So when we come back full circle to the dietary discussion, the main thing is to look at those parameters of metabolic health, test, assess, address, don't guess. The other thing is you can no longer look at someone and tell if they're metabolically broken because there are a ton of people walking around known as Tofies. How many of you know what I mean when I say Tofi? Anyone want to shout it out? Yeah. Besides Katrina? I'd love to hear her. Uh, Katrina, outside, thin, thin, thin outside, fat inside. Yeah. Exactly. Thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And crazily, those are the patients that are more concerning than those who look mm. the part of metabolic inflexibility. So this is the other piece here is you can't know those skinny on the outside people are struggling just as much metabolically internally without testing. And a lot of times these folks have so much more visceral fat than their outwardly pudgy colleagues that they're missed and they're more metabolically broken. 
And so these are where the testing comes in. But ultimately, this is where we can get into the fights about whether carnivores better, ketos better, vegans better, vegetarians better, omnivore better, whatever it is. We don't have to have those conversations anymore. We go down to assessing the patient's metabolic blueprint based on those parameters we've talked about. The labs. So for instance, the insulin should be well under five in a healthy individual. Um, it cancering should probably be a little bit lower depending on the situation. Um, just as some examples, there's this concept known as the GKI, which is the glucose to ketone index. The standard American is walking around with a, a GKI of around 25 to 30. To give you an example of how we use uh, food or lack thereof, or a particular therapeutic diet to treat cancer, we aim to get that number under one. That shows you how far off kilter. I just came from a conference this summer where we they talked about, this is not just in the cancer world, this is in the entire metabolic landscape, whether you have Alzheimer's, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, um, you know, or cancer, any of these conditions, we all need to be aiming to get our GKI under five. That's the goal today. So that means to get that glucose down, basically insulin restricting and carbohydrate restricting is the goal. And so because we're all so uniquely individual, we all have certain epigenetics. So for instance, I can eat a pint of berries and not have it affect my blood sugar. My, my husband looks at a pint of berries and it affects his. Um, I'm the person who would like to be a vegan or a vegetarian because that's my preference taste wise, but my chemistry does not allow for that very well. My husband, on the other hand, would love to be a carnivore, but each time he eats a steak, his insulin spikes like crazy. He has epigenetic hiccups with an ACSL1 SNP that makes red meat create major gluconeogenesis in his body. So we've learned these nuances about ourselves. I need more protein. He needs less protein to function optimally. These are just some examples. So when we look at someone's metabolic health, 99.9% .9 of the time, your patients, yourselves need to lower your carbohydrate intake pretty significantly. Okay. And it's very difficult to do that in our standard American approach to the diet today. It's difficult to do that as a vegan or a vegetarian, especially as a vegan, you can do it as a vegetarian, but you have to really know your macros well and know how to nourish yourself. But ultimately to be a really balanced omnivore is probably the easiest way to go about this. Because if you're somebody like my husband, a carnivore diet will make you just as diabetic as a vegan diet. Okay. And this one kind of blows people's minds. So you have to start to look at your N of one of how that translates. But ultimately when you do find that common denominator plant dense, because there's so many other cofactors, there's fiber, there's polyphenols. There's a lot of your anti-cancer agents, there's enzymes, there's all kinds of goodies in there that can help support a healthy terrain. Next being a higher fat intake, and probably uh, and quality fat intake, get rid of those seed oils, bring your omega-6s down and your omega-3s up. Then a little bit of protein to your needs. So in the cancer patient, for instance, 0.8 grams per kilogram is our rule of thumb. So it's not a high protein diet for cancer patients. Healthy non-cancering individuals can handle about double that amount of protein without it causing problems. And then literally the cherry on top is just that, Perhaps some of the monk fruit or stevia, if you have a little palate and you want to bring a little sweetness into your life, if you become really metabolically flexible, you might be able to handle a little bit of honey or, or fruit, but you have to get yourself metabolically flexible and metabolically adapted to be able to utilize those things appropriately again. So for instance, I'll use this as an example. I had a, I had a two hour conversation with Dr. Joe Marcola yesterday, who's basically just flipped out the whole world of him talking about that. He's now like basically eating 500 grams a day of carbohydrates. I'm like, first of all, Joe, you are an N of one. Second of all, you were metabolically healthy for years, he's been eating carbohydrate restriction, insulin restriction diet for over eight straight years. So for him to be able to get out to the world and say, you can all eat many carbs, that would be true if you've all been Joe Mercola for the past eight years. 
Okay. Until you can prove to me that you've been Joe Mercola for the last eight years, that is probably not a really good idea. And so my ask of him was to explain to people his process, his journey before just telling people black and white, do this, not that. So it was a really good engaging conversation. And there is, once you become metabolically healthy and flexible, you should be able to move easily in out of that dual hybrid engine, right? You should be able to burn fat when you need to burn fat, burn glucose when you need to burn glucose and be able to easily move back and forth. But when we know that 93% or better of the world can't do that, we have to take extra steps to get them in a flexible state where they can become what they were divinely designed to do. Whew, that was a lot. Oh, it was all, (laughs) I love it. You don't, you don't, uh, step back from those tough conversations and those controversial (laughs) items. I think that's what I love you most. Um, can you go into like how the therapeutic ketosis can actually benefit cancer clients? Cause I think there's a lot of confusion around what is nutritional ketosis and therapeutic and why do we need that? Okay. Well, first I want a lot of folks think that of ketosis, they think it's just a diet, right? So ketosis is a physiologic state. So let's start with that conversation. And there's multiple roads to Rome to get to that state. So you can get into ketosis with a high fat, low carbohydrate diet. That's one strategy to get you there. And again, let's talk quality fats and let's talk not, not dirty keto or internet keto. Let's talk and not high protein keto. This is not an Atkins diet. This is not even an Atkins modified diet. This is a clean, still veggie dense diet. So when I speak to this in my cancering community, I talk about the fact they still need nine to 15 servings of vegetables a day that flips people out. Now you can do that in this world. We do that a lot through pestos and special sauces and soups and purees, that's actually a very easy way to get in that many veggies without blowing all of your macros out, you know, into high carbohydrate land. And so if you stay basically above the ground, we don't even count the herbs and the leafy greens and um, radishes and cucumbers and zucchinis. We don't really even count those as our carbs because those you kind of, they're mostly water, they're high in fiber, and you just kind of don't, don't worry about counting those. So that's one place here. The other way to get into a state of physiologic ketosis is with actually eating nothing at all. So fasting an intermittent fasted state. Our oldest strategy of, of co- that we've co-evolved with since the beginning of time. We've used this as, as spiritual rites of passage. We've used this in healing, you know, natural healing processes in ancient, you know, Hippocrates times and beyond. Um, this has been a strategy in pretty much every medical system known to humankind, even in standard of care today, up until the 1960s, when somebody got it up there, a bee in their bonnet thinking this was a really terrible thing to have patients do. So really up until the 1960s, fasting was still a recommended therapy for many of our patients, even from the allopathic medical world. So when you fast, if you go four hours without food, you already start to move into a fasted state. By the time you hit, it's like 12 hours, 18 hours, 24 hours, you start to drop your glycogen stores. After that, you start to drop your insulin. And by day three of a water fast, you should be in a pretty robust state of ketosis. And this may need to guide people a little more elegantly. Again, please do the N of one on this, but that's one way to get there. Another way to get into ketosis is just carbohydrate restriction, not even changing when you're eating or what you're eating, just less of the carbs without even having to go into the high fat. You can even get into ketosis as a carnivore if you have the right genes. And you can even get into ketosis as a carb restricting vegan if you have the right genes. You can also get there with exogenous ketones supplements. So ketone esters, ketone salts, These are some other means, and there's even pharmaceutical means to get yourself into a little low grade. Not not very much fun to take some of those because they have other side effects, but you can take some of the exogenous ketones. So I mentioned that because a lot of people kind of get it in their head and the confusion gets out there of like, well, I read something that fats cause cancer or drive cancer. Well, even when you talk to the experts in the metabolic field of oncology, that's an endogenous 
fatty acid synthesis or fatty acid oxidation process. And it's not based on the fat you're taking in, unless you're taking in terrible trans fats, high seed oil fats, high omega-6 fats. Those are bad for all of us, cancer or not. Those are the drivers of all of this, right? We just, what, a couple, I don't know, generations ago, we were a three to one ratio anywhere of uh, uh, the three to one ratio of omega sixes to omega threes. And a hundred years prior to that, we were a one to one ratio of those. We're now about a 36 to one ratio of omega six to omega threes in a very short window of time. And our bodies have not evolved with that. And so it doesn't know what to do with this information. So one of the conversations is kind of brings Joe back into the conversation, Dr. Mercola is he's talking about the importance of restricting linoleic acid. And when you really look at the linoleic acid, he's still like telling the truth on one level, but he's taking it to that extreme. The linoleic acid is what's so high in our omega-6 seed oils. And the majority of the fats we're feeding our planet today. So I live down in Mexico and I can barely eat out. I have to ask for them to, I have to take my own oil or have them grill everything because everything is bathed in corn oil here. And I get a terrible reaction to that now. When I'm in Europe, I have to ask for them to use butter or olive oil because everyone's using canola oil or soybean oil today. So this is the place where we are all taking in just mountains of these, of these oils and these fats. And so when we talk about specific to a cancer treatment, therapeutic ketosis state, we wanna lower our inflammation by lowering our omega-6s. We want to carbohydrate restrict so that we can lower our insulin, which in turn lowers our insulin growth factor, which is the driver in, depending on the research, 70 to 90% of all cancer types out there. Okay. Very simply put. So we don't have to get into the, the how right? We just know that that's what you have to do. And so if you have patients that come to you that are very, very strongly committed to a particular dietary intervention, test, assess, address, don't guess, look at their SNPs if they're not uh, um, reaching or achieving a state of therapeutic ketosis or nutritional ketosis. Nutritional ketosis on your blood levels would be anywhere from 0.8 to two, and a therapeutic level would be two and above right? And so when we're looking at that GKI, you want to get your glucose down as far as you can and your ketones up as high as you can to optimize this. And that's why things like time-restricted eating, um, carbohydrate restriction, intermittent fasting, extended water fast, these are ways that you can keep pushing your body into that healthier GKI to push your body back into that beautiful dual hybrid engine that it was designed to be. Oh, love it. Love it. Thank you. Um, I want to make sure that we save time for questions because people yes. are popping questions. I see them coming. Go shop. <laughs> but I want you to talk for a little bit about, you know, if, if some of the, the students are, are aspiring practitioners are interested in working with cancer, mm -hmm. what would be some of the essential tools like um, testing, understanding that they would need? How would they go about getting into this specialty? Talk a little bit more about your program, all of that. Well, I mean, first of all, like I, re I do recommend people start with the book and this is not to sell the book. I wrote the book yeah. because I got tired of saying the same thing over and over again. And I really honestly thought my patients and my mom would be the only people reading it. I didn't expect that it would be hundreds of thousands of copies and seven languages of two more coming out later. And it's still really relevant today as it was May, 2017, when it first came out. So it's a good tool and resource and there's over 300 references in it. So it's a really good starting point that really pulls people away from that dogma and, and just gives you some of the data that you need to feel more confident about having these conversations. It's even as simple as just handing that book to a client or a client's loved one to say, read this and see if you have questions, get them started. Um, so that's one method. If you are someone who does not have the desire to maybe be the doctor or the practitioner for someone dealing with cancer, but you want to have good resources or access to good resources, or you want to just feel a little more comfortable in this space, as I mentioned, 
And this, this is a number by, I mean, even the World Health Organization shows that one in two men and one in 2.4 women will have cancer in their lifetime. And that World Health Organization global cancer stats show that we'll be doubling our cancer rates globally by 2030. That's not far down the road, guys. Oh. So all of us will be facing this at some point. And so that's kind of overwhelming. So a lot of folks who are just interested in having tools and resources and knowing what to do with it are often interested in taking our advocacy program, which goes through all of those terrain 10 buckets and the resources and how to support somebody completely from a terrain centric, non-medically intrusive or overly supportive environment. So if you're just like, I just want to feel a little more armed, <laughs> a little more comfortable in this zone, that might be something to consider. If however, you are a provider who has access to, or the ability yourself to order labs, to order imaging and to prescribe pharmaceuticals if and where needed. So whether it's you directly or someone you work with in a practice that would be willing to do that with or for you, then you might be a really good candidate for our patient, um, our, our, our practitioner training, which means also helping us help the thousand plus inquiries we get a month from all over the world, asking for someone trained in this approach. So to, to date, we've trained 155 um, practitioners in 16 countries and nearly 300 patient advocates in 16 countries. We have our eighth cohort starting in September. Right now we have 50 people on the wait list um, that are going through the application process for that. We have our fifth cohort of our advocates coming in November. And so that we also are taking applications for that process. And for our patient advocates, we do want you to have a little bit more of a medical background, nutrition, nursing, physical therapy, something so you have a little bit of a nice foundation in the sciences because we move fast. Katrina will tell you in the practitioner world, we move really fast, but we are, um, we're a community that leans in and supports one another. My ask is that we can't meet the demand as is, and we're constantly needing and adding more people to our tribe, to our network, to this global movement. And one of the cool things that's happening, and I'll be able to make some more announcements about this soon. So if you don't already have access to our newsletter, please go to mtih.org and sign up for it. We hope to be making some really big announcements in the next month which is giving expression of what's getting ready to happen with this hospital and not just one, but hopefully many across the planet. And so we don't have enough people to frankly, women, man, human, these stations, and we need to impact that. I just got back from six countries um, in five weeks doing nine lectures and the theme across the board at every conference I attended this year was all about metabolic health. And even though I'm teaching and speaking specifically to the metabolic approach to cancer, Katrina will tell you, this is the metabolic approach to life, to, to illness, to prevention. It's all the same. It doesn't matter. It's what people get scared when they hear the big C word. You guys, it's no different. Many of you probably already work comfortably with folks with diabetes or cardiovascular disease or Alzheimer's or obesity, correct? Mm -hmm. This is no different than that. And that blows people's mind. And so we're definitely looking for more people who have a, a drive and a passion and a purpose in working in the metabolic space, the metabolic health space, the mitochondrial health space. And so those are the things when Katrina is asking about what that is, what we do, we don't have enough help to meet the need as it is. And with the numbers I started out explaining and what I'm telling you about cancer and the global pandemics of all of these metabolic conditions that are what we are facing, we have to get folks up to speed to be able to handle this tsunami, um, the, the real pandemic that we're all dealing with. Oh, yes. And this is exactly why I wanted Dr. Nation to come speak to RWS, because you guys have the base foundation to do this work. Like this just piggybacks on it perfectly. I was shocked at how well they just meshed. So, okay. Um, should we dive into questions? Do it. I'm ready. All right. You guys ready? That's the real question. <laughs> um, Victoria asked, uh, thoughts on screening? Hmm. Screening, like specifically like the cancer screening? Is Victoria still in here? There's there were some people. Yeah, Victoria, if you want to jump on and, and ask more details, yeah. you're welcome to. 
Um, there was some discussion about different types of testing, Galeri test, um, yeah. different things. Yeah. So go for so it. My guess, is, you know, a few years back, we had access to some early diagnostic testing, such as Oncoblot and a few other tests that are just unfortunately no longer available, right? So our most modern version of this, which actually now has FDA approval, is what Katrina mentioned, the Gallery test, also known as... Um, the main company is Grail, but it's Grail Gallery, G-A-L-L-E-R-I, and it's an early diagnostic test. Is it perfect? No. Are any of them? No. That's why if you look at it along with perhaps imaging, if there is something suspicious there or other labs, that's very helpful. But that test runs it's about $900 for um, a, an early diagnostics, which are looking for certain protein fingerprints that show a propensity towards having a cancer going on in that moment. Um, and so, and I should say expressing in that moment, because we all have cancer all the time, but whether it's expressing and in circulation as a protein in your blood, that's what the gallery is picking up on. There are definitely other tests coming down the pipeline for early diagnostics, but they're not out yet. There are some companies who claim that they do that. I would not put my eggs in that basket just yet. Hang tight. And the next year to five years, we will probably have one of these coming out every few months that will be effective testing. We're getting down to blood testing, breath testing, even voice testing is starting to show up in the realm. Like for lung cancers, you're actually finding changes in the voice in some of the AI materials that are out there. So there are some really cool testing coming along. The other cool testing that's available, which is non-radiation, non-contrast dye, which is springing up all over the United States, North America in general, and expanding globally is called pre Nuvo. And Katrina can explain that to you guys more later if you want, which is a, 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 an updated, upgraded um, MRI. A couple of years ago on Dr. Peter Atia's website or um, on his podcast in July of 2019, actually, excuse me, July 2021, I heard him interview this gentleman, Dr. Argavala, who is an MD, PhD, who was a radiation oncologist, but also had a PhD in chemical engineering, who decided he could build and launch a better MRI device. And he did just that. This is pre -Nuvo, and this is what's available. So non-contrast dye, and as someone who's still dealing 32 years later of gadolinium poisoning, and my kidneys will never be the same, may never recover, I am really excited about this technology, as well as the technology that we know that just simply four to five scans, so four to five PET scans or CT scans in your lifetime, lifetime, is equivalent to the amount of radiation that they were exposed to with Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Okay. This is why it's abominable that we are still using these technologies when we have better access to less harmful non-cancer causing technologies that will not damage your organs in the meantime. So pre Nuvo is a really good option that I'm very excited about things like Sonocena, which is an updated upgraded uh, breast ultrasound that has very, very thin imaging of the breast, way more sensitive and specific also no contrast dye, also no smashing or radiation, makes total sense. So the technologies and the testing are coming to a point in time where we all have access to something better than we've ever had before in the standard of care or the alternative world. I want to hop in on that piece just really quickly in terms of like the types of testing, because I noticed, and I was impressed with the fact that in the, in the types of testing you were talking about earlier, you didn't talk about cancer, like screening for cancer itself. Everything was about metabolic function, which is completely in our wheelhouse as practitioners, right? And we have a lot of non-licensed practitioners here who aren't going to be doing diagnostics. And I would encourage any of you who are non-licensed, it's good to know about what cancer screening out there is available. That's not our real house, right? Like I would not go there at all. You want to be focusing. And I think this is one of the most hopeful things that we hear in this conversation is that we already have so many of the tools to help our clients, no matter sort of where they are in their diagnostic journey. I think it's a really, really important thing to remember in this conversation. I love that you brought that up, Margaret, because that's just, it is you guys, what I tell even the doctors I train and even the um, advocates that I train, we don't treat cancer ever. We treat the terrain. Yeah. 
we evaluate for the terrain and we treat and support the terrain. And in doing that is where the magic happens for the treatment and prevention of all con con you know, chronic illness. So this was, uh, I love that you mentioned that this kind of concept of hopefulness and that I want you guys to already recognize you are already resourced to know how to help this entire culture around us and around the globe meet and optimize their terrain in a very, very different way. I think too, I, I saw some questions in here about um, the affordability, the accessibility mm -hmm. of this care. And I think that when we're thinking about this as well, if you have a client with limited resources, you now have great information here of where to look for your client's metabolic health. Right. And even if you are just focusing on really optimizing that one aspect with the blood sugar regulation, and you were to work in this, in this one particular thing, there is so much that you can do just in this one area, again, wherever they are on their diagnostic journey, um, hopefully long before a diagnosis to prevent anything from happening. But we all know sometimes people need a bit of a kick in the pants in order to make the changes that they need to make. So, um, so just, you know, I think that there's ways this could get really expensive in a hurry and it can also not be. And that is, it doesn't have to be is, is what I'm hearing from you. hundred percent. And those simple things like you can access the train 10 questionnaire online. You can access that the handing over of the book. You know, if you've got a client who's really, really destitute, I would, I would donate the book. Like that's like, so like, this is so important to me that there's so many tools within that book that are actionable and free, right. Or incredibly low cost. One of the other things that's happening with the um, MTIH, the metabolic train Institute of health is we are creating partnerships with lab companies where we can drive because guess what happens when we all put our resources together, labs like volume. And they can drive down price with volume. So to give you an example, when I used to do my monthly tests on cancer patients 20 years ago, which included the CBC, the CMP, the quantitative C-reactive protein, the sedimentation rate, and an LDH, that would cost my patients about $225 a month. Now, a lot of people back then were like, that's a bargain. And that's what I worked out with the lab back then. Today, we can get those tests for basically under $25 a month. That's how far we've come in a period of time because we have enough volume of people ordering these labs. And the coolest thing is, thank you, COVID, that we now have opened up the arena to um, direct to consumer lab testing. And that will often lower cost of laboratory way down even further. And as we build our network even bigger, we will be able to drive these prices down even further. So even down to the imaging, we hope that someday Prenuvo will, uh, will work with us to even drive that price down even further, because there are lots of imaging centers that have opened up that for $4,500, your insurance is being billed for an MRI, but in these, these costs, these, um, uh, you like places where you pay, pay cash for your MRI, it's $2,500. And then if you go to some of these imaging centers that are pooling their resources, you can get your MRI for four to $500. Like this is how, this is the power of all of us and our resources. And so that's one component. The other component of our Institute is that we're nonprofit. And so all of our educational platforms, all of our educational programs, the funds that come in, come in to get our Institute going further to expand on our education, to expand on our reach, but also to create patient grants for care for someone wanting an integrative oncology approach or access to education with a grant that would not otherwise have the funding to pay for the, ter the train advocate program or the physician training program. We've also in the last year launched our global pricing. So for instance, if you're a physician practicing in say Egypt, it's not going to cost you the same amount that it does in the United States. We make that price point fit your region of the world as well. So our goal is not, this is not about making money. This is about changing the planet. We're in trouble. And so our goal is to bring all these resources together. And we're way more powerful as a collective than we are as any one little siloed institution. And so I really hope that this is being conveyed in some form or fashion with how we are trying to make a dent of getting people trained, but also getting this care accessible by all. I love it. Okay. So we have one more question. There's a question talking about ketosis feeding cancer. 
Mm-hmm. Can you give us your thoughts on that? Sure, sure. So this has this actually comes up a lot. And first of all, there's two, a couple points to this. So first, when you take a look at these studies, go back and read the actual study design. What you will realize is almost all the studies that say this are not only not a ketogenic diet, <laughs> Okay. Like when they sit there and say, we're giving the patient, you know, this many calories of fat and you're like, wow, okay, that's a good high fat diet, but then you're not really lowering the carbohydrate intake. Let me be very clear. When you give high fat, no matter the quality of the fat, along with high carbohydrate, that's a bad idea for anybody. Okay. If you give high quality fat with carbohydrate restriction, that's, that can be a pretty good idea for most people. If you just give a normal high quality fat diet with a carbohydrate restriction, you're also getting people into a better state of health. So first of all, those studies are very, very skewed. They're not accurate. And when you look at the, the first of all, they're usually in either cell lines, which mean nothing. If you don't have a liver attached to the study, you're not actually measuring ketosis. Okay. So that's a big one. So when you're like, oh, this is a cell line study that talks that acetyl, you know, um, acetone could cause problems here. If you're not having a liver attached to that, be it an animal or a human being or a dog or whatever, you don't, you're not getting an accurate read. That's impossible. You need to have a liver in the process to really measure this. Number two, take a look at the chow that's being fed to the animals in these studies. First of all, it's all omega-6s. It's all high in linoleic acid. It's all seed oils, soybean oils. You look at these, they're the worst. Like you would never feed another human being this type of a diet. So that is a bad idea for anybody. And the reason why it's not that the ketones cause the cancer, it's the inflammatory process that's driving the cancer cells. And so they're, they're blaming the ketones for what the inflammation is actually doing. And so these are, these studies are really terrible. So when you get the ex- experts like Dr. Thomas Daraj, Dr. Ahmed El Saka, Dr. Uh, Thomas Seyfried, Dr. D'Agostino and Angela Pop, you bring these guys into the equation and they tear these studies apart left and right because they're not quality studies. They would never get published. And we don't understand how they even get in publication, but there's literally no, no studies where ketones directly drive or cause a cancering process. Ketone bodies don't have that ability. Awesome. Thank you for clarifying. She asked, um, she wrote, she's specifically asking about the, the BRAF mutation, making mm-hmm. them able to feed the ketone bodies and such. And I remember when that BRAF 7600 study came out several years ago, it's one in a sea of other studies. So just to give qualification, I've been treating melanoma patients, which are typically BRAF positive and BRAF 7600 positive patients for decades prior to that study ever coming out and never saw issues. There's actually been multiple studies coming out debunking that. That particular study. And again, going down and breaking down what I just described was the quality or lack thereof of the study. Um, in fact, one of the cool things about ketone bodies themselves, they actually help reverse the mutation of a BRAF mutation. So there's some really cool things. We also know that uh, ketone bodies have an impact on KRAS mutations, um, our natural PDL and PD1 inhibitors. So there's a lot of really cool studies come out that are actually becoming better quality studies, because people are starting to take a look at the, 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 the dietary formulation in these studies, they're starting to pay more attention to, and they're starting to do more human trials. In fact, I believe we're up to 62 as last time I checked on clinicaltrials.gov. I think we're up to 62 human clinical trials on the use of therapeutic ketosis in the cancering environment. So in a cancer patient, not in, you know, these aren't animal or cell line studies. So we are definitely finally doing some more meaningful studies in this arena. Oh, I love it. Okay. So we're a little over time and I want to respect your time. How are you doing? We've got, I'm good. I did blue. I hope you guys are doing okay. Great. Um, we've got a question about, you know, if working with athletes, would you still recommend the minimal carbohydrates, um, whole unrefined carbs, like sweet potatoes? Is there a maximum number of grams and such that you would do? 
So one of my uh, most challenging patients to take care of are my uh, endurance athletes who still think that carbs are what are giving them their superpower. So I would really encourage you to take a look at the work of people like Dom D'Agostino, um, Mark Sisson, Rob Wolf, and others who are like extreme endurance uh, athletes who are fueled on ketones, basically. But even with that specific to this patient, to the, you know, to this elite athlete that you might be working with, don't guess, test. And so that's the places you can have them do a continuous glucose monitor. You can have them run their ketones. You can do their basic tests for the inflammation, the blood sugar patterns to see if they are a candidate for a little bit higher carbohydrate, if they're metabolically flexible and healthy enough to be able to utilize and burn that extra carbohydrate. Um, I think you'll be surprised. I think a lot of athletes are often shocked when they actually look under the hood at their numbers to realize that they're walking diabetics most of the time. And that shocks them. You cannot outrun a crappy diet. <laughs> I yeah. love that. I love that. Test don't guess. <laughs> uh, so there's some questions about, you know, does this process work for children? And would you recommend a low carb diet for kids? So actually we learned about a therapeutic ketogenic diet over a hundred years ago in the pediatric epilepsy community, a study done through Johns Hopkins and has been utilized for over a hundred straight years in the pediatric population ever since. And as I mentioned before, we're naturally born in a state of ketosis. So it is a natural state of our being. And it's something that is safe to drive people into deeper. And so um, in my world, I have a few experts in our network that are pediatric focused. I have colleagues who practice in hospitals and institutions all over the world who focus in pediatric oncology and metabolic flexibility and, and metabolic ketosis is, is just as critical and supportive in that environment as it is in the adult environment. And there's no safety concerns or differences in the way we approach it in either in either age group. So I think that's pretty ex exciting. There's actually a book coming out in early 2024 by one of our graduates and one of our colleagues, Dr. Dagmara Bain. This is her jam. This is her area of expertise. And being the mother of a daughter who's gone through this process and is doing really, really, really well, one of the things we know specifically like childhood cancers are often things like sarcomas, leukemias, lymphomas, these ironically are some of the most highly glycolytic, highly metabolic cancers out there. And also the brain tumors, the neuroblastomas, the medulloblastomas, the DIPGs, the um, astrocytomas, also giant glucose hogs. And so this population are the easiest to work with. And especially the younger they are, the easier. Um, the hardest part of working with the pediatric population is just their parents as you can well imagine, <laughs> because it's the parent going through their own psychology of, oh, I'm going to keep my, pa my pa baby from having a cupcake. Um, so you need, it's about normalizing and knowing. Um, in fact, I learned a lot that Katrina's family has like become like the keto baking experts um, and doing these things like kids are really really malleable and really easy to change. And you can make a lot of their fun, special treats for them. So they still feel normalized in whatever social environments they're in. But ultimately your kiddo going through a cancering process and getting them on a therapeutic ketogenic diet, the whole family would benefit going on this. And so people like the Max Love Project, if you want to maybe give a link to them, Katrina, they're a family, an entire organization that focuses on pediatric brain tumors and um, using a therapeutic ketogenic diet. You could look at the, into the Arizona um, Children's Hospital studies in DIPG. We actually are getting a grant right now to do a ketogenic study in DIPG patients. Just so you know, this is a very aggressive brainstem tumor that has a nine-month survival survival rate with standard of care. And our only focus is to show that we can create better quality of life for these patients and their families. But we already know because of our own clinical experience that our outcomes and are far exceeding than what standard of care can meet. I have, I've got three or four patients over 10 years at the DIPG. That's never, ever heard of. 
And so these are the types of things that we can definitely be instrumental in helping support our pediatric oncology population in a tremendous way, especially knowing how safe it's been used in the epileptic community for over a hundred years. And that, oh, that's your one, uh, Charlie's Foundation, Katrina, if you didn't already put them into the mix, they're an excellent resource for all things pediatric and keto. Yeah, yeah, that's an amazing resource and such. Absolutely. Okay, um, so many good, I wanted to read this because I love that Andrea shared this. She wrote that um, she had a pre-nuvo scan done in February and found an asymptomatic brain tumor, which she had removed in April. It was a grade three oleodendroglioma, and she's an oncology nutrition consultant. So thankfully she knew exactly what to do. pre was amazing and it saved my life, she wrote. So. Oh, I got that. Dr. Nisha, um, I have been following you for years now, and I studied with Jess Kelly's program, um, Oncology Nutrition Institute, for any of you guys who are interested. Um, I will be doing your program. I was going to do it over the spring, except for I got a brain tumor and had to get it out. <laughs> um, nice so, focus. I appreciate that. Yeah. Excuse. That's a good one. <laughs> but I have also moved to Arizona over the past week to be closer to my surgeon who was recommended by Allison Gannett, who you know well. Um, Chris Smith was my surgeon. And um, I know you're opening your hospital in Tucson. So here I am. I'm here to work with you. Yay, I got chills. I'm so excited. Be careful yes. what you ask for, Andrea, because I will come after you in the best I, way possible. Yes. I'm ready. Um, but Pranubu is amazing. You are amazing. I've been in nutritional ketosis since February, therapeutic ketosis um, most of that time. And um, I work with Dr. Duhan. He, you know, I, your network has saved my life and I am very grateful, um, but so I want to help. And if anything good can come out of me having brain cancer, it's working with this community to make people healthier and to ensure that, you know, there is an alternative to standard of care. <sighs> Yeesh. Thanks, Andrea. That was awesome. Yay. Oh my gosh. I'm going to send a little, a little explosion of celebration right there up in the corner. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Andrea. You. Keep it up. Thank you. Keep going. Thanks. All right. Well, I think that is a fantastic note to end on. So thank you so much, Dr. Nisha. And you guys, where can they find you? If so, they didn't get it already. Yeah, please come, come look for me. Probably the best place right now, because it seems to bring everything together is at mtih.org, which talks about all the things we're doing with our events and our conferences and where we're speaking, updated podcasts, um, other things along those lines are all like, again, free resources typically, as well as getting access to the newsletter, um, finding out about our trainings of, that are coming up. If you've got a doctor that you work with that you want them to get into the training, you know, send them our way. But that kind of covers the gamut of all the things that we're up to, as well as our beautiful directory where Katrina is featured, Dr. Duhan is featured, Dr. Chris Smith isn't featured there anymore, even though he's come to my training program. He's, he's like, I got enough going on. He wanted to come through our training program as the head neuro um, neurosurgeon at Barrows Neurology in Arizona. He wanted to understand because his outcomes with GBMs far exceed any of his colleagues globally. And he cannot understand why this is not standard of care in the brain tumor community. So Andrea's really landed in the, in like quite the little nest of really stellar um, folks out there, but those are some people on the directory. You can see who's already at it um, and know that we need to keep expanding this globally. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your brilliance. You guys are already doing this. I just want to reiterate what Margaret said and what Katrina's met, um, voiced here as well. You are already doing it. Just take that next leap, that next step of supporting people's terrain so they can become more resilient um, to whatever they've got, whatever they're facing. Thank you so much. And I really want to emphasize what you have said. You guys, this is really powerful work. You are really well positioned. If this is calling to you, at a minimum, 
go check out Dr. Nisha's work, become part of her community, join her newsletter. If there's only one action step you come from away with this tonight, do that. Um, if any of this is, is calling to you in terms of her practitioner training or the advocacy, I think that is so incredibly important. You are so well poised to do this. So um, thank you also, um, Andrea, for sharing your story. That is powerful. That is powerful. Katrina, thank you for making this connection. Mm -hmm. Dr. Nasha, keep doing incredible work. Any way that we, I personally, and we as a community can support you, we are here to help. Thanks awesome. you all. It means the world really grateful. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Have a great night. Ciao.